The biblical manuscripts have variants, and questions can be asked about their transmission through history, but these questions should not be discussed in public. It's not wise. They should only be discussed in private. I'm just kidding. Who do you think I am? Some Muslim scholar? And I would never bring it up in public. And I don't think it is wise to bring it up in public. Why didn't I say it? Because it should not be said in public. You will not find one lecture of mine about this issue. It should never be brought up in public. This is not something you discuss amongst the masses, ya akhi. It's not wise. So let's talk about these things publicly and jump right into our topic with Gabriel Reynolds, who gives us a good summary. These kiraat, that is variant Quranic readings or recitations, are part of the history of the text, not its starting point. And the idea of a discrete number of different yet equally canonical kiraat did not develop before the 10th century when great divisions over the Quranic text led Ibn Mujahid, among others, to sponsor this regulatory concept. Ibn Mujahid argued that there are seven equally valid kiraat. Others argued for 10 or 14. The gradual yet never complete acceptance of the argument for seven kiraat was generally accompanied with the caveat that each kiraat has two versions. Effectively then, 14 different versions were considered equally authentic, only one of which was Hafs and Azm. That is the reading on which the 1924 standardized Quran is based. There's one important qualifier at this point. These various readings or kiraat do not primarily involve the consonantal skeleton of the text, that is the razum. However, this is not always the case. Fred Donner notes that many of these kiraat affect only the vowelings of the text and might be explained as later quibbles imposed by Muslim Quran specialists on an essentially stable consonantal rosm. But some of the variants involve changes in the rosm as well. In fact, in the earliest centuries of Islam, the term kiraat was used a bit differently from how it's used today. For instance, in a short 8th century tafsir, we have 67 variant readings introduced with in the reading of or they used to read it as. Of these 67 variant readings, 24 of them have a different rosm. However, in this video, we're going to use the term kiraat as it's understood today and limit ourselves primarily to questions surrounding the variant readings of the Quran and when they began to be considered canonical and divine, going back to Muhammad and thus from Allah. Reynolds has already given us a very nice summary and pointed us to the official canonization in the 10th century. But let's do a little digging. To begin, as should be expected, numerous Muslim scholars dealt with the issue of kiraat. Muslim sources refer to several works on kiraat throughout the 8th, 9th, and 10th centuries, describing dozens of variant Quranic readings. By the 11th century, 50 variant readings of the Quran were compiled in an extensive work on kiraat. Al-Tabri, Ibn Mujahid's teacher, collected about 20 variant readings of the Quran as well. However, he did not consider them to be of divine origin. For Al-Tabri, these variants arose from the process of the Quran's normal transmission through history. Consequently, he was free to reject them or accept them as he saw fit, based on things like grammar and syntax. When you see criticism of him, even today on this issue, that's why. He rejected some readings that later came to be called canonical. However, even in al tabris time and after, when other Muslim scholars were deciding criteria for what was to be considered canonical, they retrojected some of their criteria back into earlier Islamic history, making al tabri seem obsolete even when compared to his contemporaries. But in reality, al tabri was in some ways similar to some modern scholars and their critical texts. But he made no attempt to designate or canonize as authoritative his readings. Ibn Majahid, therefore, marks a paradigm change, since before him, out of all of the works on Qur'at, there doesn't seem to be any concern for limiting the readings of the Quran to a specific number. And while Ibn Mujahid does limit the number of readings, he does not appear to argue that the readings he canonized are of divine nature. Shadi Nasser says, Ibn Mujahid observes that the scholars' disagreement on the different kiraat is similar to their disagreement on the legal rulings. In other words, in the same way that some Muslim scholars differed on legal matters, which ultimately, of course, gave rise to different legal schools within Islam, 
They also disagreed on variant Qurans. No one argues that all the different legal rulings by the four legal schools are canonical and absolute, and that the differences among the various legal schools are of divine nature. In other words, no one claims that the Prophet himself declared and practiced all these different and often contradictory legal rulings. By the same token, no one should argue that the Prophet read the Quran in all the seven and ten readings, as later Muslim scholars vehemently argued. Unfortunately, Ibn Mujahid leaves us with some questions. He didn't tell us why he chose seven readings, and though he lists some general guidelines, he never explicitly stated his criteria for selecting his readings. Nevertheless, Ibn Mujahid chose his readers, one each from Mecca, Medina, Damascus, Basra, and three from Kufa, due to a complex situation there, for a total of seven. And in doing this, he did not argue that these readings were revelation. That is a fallacious assumption made by some later scholars. Shortly after Ibn Mujahid, other compilations of various numbers of readings began emerging. Later on in the 14th century, the great Qiraat scholar Ibn al-Jazri canonized three additional readings, but then changed his mind a couple of decades later. As one would expect, Ibn Mujahid's decision was met with some criticism, and some of it was quite harsh. One criticism is that in choosing seven Qiraat, Ibn Mujahid could confuse uneducated Muslims, making them think that the seven Qiraat were the same as the seven Akhruf. Confusion I still see today from Muslims on my channel. Perhaps that criticism of Ibn Mujahid was valid. But speaking of myths that won't die, here's another one that we're all familiar with. In spite of the seven readings, the permitted canonized discrepancies among the seven readings grew exponentially. Muslim scholars wanted to limit the variants, but these kept multiplying. Subsequently, the scholars wanted to justify these variants by attributing them to different aspects of the Arabic tribal dialects. The variants are just different dialects. Yes, we've heard that before. Throughout the centuries after Ibn Mujahid's canonization, debates continued over which readings should be used, how many there actually were, and how the Qiraat were transmitted. In other words, how sound are the Isnads? This is where things get interesting. Here's the standard modern Muslim understanding of the Quran. It's the speech of God which was revealed to the Prophet in Arabic and is inimitable down to its shortest surah. The Quran is that which is written in the Masaif transmitted through Tawatr, and recited during the Muslims' liturgical practices. Transmission through Tawatr was rigorously developed with the Quran because it is, among other things, divine speech and the basis of Islamic law. This means of transmission is multiply attested and thoroughly sound. Anything transmitted through Tawatr constitutes certain knowledge for Muslims. This, as we have just heard, is how the Quran is believed to have been transmitted. However, several Muslim scholars have argued strongly that this is not correct. Al-Zarqashi says that some late scholars have claimed that the seven readings are transmitted through Tawatr only among the generations of readers and transmitters between the eponymous readers and their students. However, Tawatr cannot be verified among the generations between the Prophet and the eponymous readers. The isnads of all the eponymous readers down to the Prophet are single chains of transmission, where the conditions of Tawatr cannot be established with such isnads. His answer to this problem is a common one, simply appealing to the authority of the consensus. According to al-Shakani, people have claimed that each one of the seven and the ten readings is Mudwatra. However, there has not been one single proof for such a claim, because all these readings were transmitted through single Ahad transmissions. This is obvious for those who are knowledgeable in the study of Isnad. Shadi Nasser states that the legal experts never had a solid proof or sound argument for such claims, that is the Tawatr of the Qur'at. Yet they had to establish the Tawatr of the canonical readings in order to meet the requirements of their theoretical framework regarding the authority and absoluteness of the Qur'an as a divine text and as a primary source of law. The problem is obvious, but it was never addressed directly. Very few people, regardless of their integrity and probity, transmitted the canonical readings. Let's pause for a brief excursus. At this point, you may be noticing some similarities between Quran and Hadith transmission. For example, modern Muslims very frequently claim 
that the Quran's readings were transmitted orally through their respective isnads. And in fact, among the early Muslims, some variant readings were evaluated like hadith in terms of their authenticity. Ibn Mujahid believes some variant readings are wrong, others are awkward and cannot be properly justified. The variant readings of the Quran are each different in terms of strength, validity, proper justification, and their relative acceptance among the reciters. Christopher Melchert compared Quran and hadith transmission and makes some interesting observations. With respect to Ibn Majahid specifically, he notes that Ibn Majahid appears to have been careless about chains of transmission himself, omitting to mention links in his account of his own chosen seven. He describes how al Sayyidi lays out rules for reckoning the quality of different isnads for the recitation of the Quran and states at the end that no one else had done this before him. Here is a sign of how incomplete the assimilation of Quran transmission to Hadith transmission had remained until his time. In all of this, we see a difference between earlier Muslims and later Muslims. In the eyes of the early Muslims, a Quranic reading could be wrong or simply weak if it lacks the element of consensus, whereas later Muslims, especially the professional reciters and the legal experts, emphasize that every single individual reading that belongs to any of the seven or ten eponymous readings is unquestionably correct and divine. And it's important to note that the transmission of the Quran was not strictly oral, as Muslims very frequently claim. Melchert notes this in the article we just cited, and numerous other scholars have noted this as well. James Bellamy states that the variant readings he discusses in his article are important to us because they prove that there was no oral tradition stemming directly from the Prophet strong enough to overcome all the uncertainties inherent in the writing system. Devin Stewart says the tradition of Quranic recitation can be shown to ignore or run roughshod over many discernible or retrievable features of the text, particularly with regard to rhyme that must represent the oldest stage of its performance. In addition, while many of the variants recognized as legitimate within Islamic tradition may plausibly have arisen through oral transmission, many others cannot being based on graphic and not phonic resemblance. And of course, we must remember that Uthman restricted variant Qurans by destroying them and issuing his own written text. He did not send out trained reciters. Clearly, a substantial part of the Quran's transmission must be in written manuscripts. But perhaps the best way to compare the Quran and Hadith is to think of the Quran as evolving past the Hadith over time. Thus, a variant reading has evolved from being similar to a legal ruling that employs consensus and disputes into becoming a soundly transmitted hadith, verified and authenticated through sound isnad and probity. As a result, the seven and ten canonical readings have successfully achieved a status of immunity against any doubt and criticism, transcending human law to become divine law itself. Excursus complete. Back to our topic. In the 10th century, dozens of variant Quran readings had emerged, as had a figure who finally had the authority of the Abbasid Caliphate to limit these readings to something more manageable. His selections later became recognized as canonical. Does that sound familiar? I'm constantly hearing from Muslims how the books of the New Testament were chosen hundreds of years after Jesus by Constantine at the Council of Nicaea. I hear this very, very frequently. And once again, Muslims are refuted by their favorite scholar. A lot of people have the misconception that it was at the Council of Nicaea that, uh, that Const the Emperor Constantine decided which books would be in the Bible at the Council of Nicaea, which is completely wrong, completely wrong, completely wrong, completely wrong. So do you realize what's happened? Muslim apologists have taken the events surrounding Ibn Mujahid's canonization smoothed out all the problems, and then repackaged these events as a false polemic against the New Testament. Two features generally characterize modern Arabic scholarship on Qira'at. First, it is apologetically concerned with defending the valid and divine nature of the canonical readings and consequently the integrity of the Quran. Second, it tries to establish a continuous tradition and a never-before-disputed consensus regarding the validity of the canonical readings, a consensus that goes back long before Ibn Mujahid. And in the Muslim world, this process can move very quickly. 
Ibn Mujahid picked a problematic reader in Kufa. His name was Hamza al-Zayat. His reading was able to move from the status of an innovation to that of divine revelation in less than 100 years. In like manner, the canonization of the seven readings evolved as well. It is true that Ibn Mujahid codified the seven readings by the beginning of the 10th century, but the notion of the seven canonical readings took some time to be established as a canon. It's not until the 11th century that we see the notion of the seven eponymous readings as an established canon. And remember, early Muslim scholars considered these variant readings of the Quran to be of human origin. But this position changed drastically in the later periods, especially after the 11th century, where the canonical readings started to be treated as divine revelation. That is, every single variant reading in the seven and ten eponymous readings was revealed by God to Muhammad. And this is what we see modern Muslims believing today. Question, in what century did the seven or ten canonical readings of the Quran begin to be regarded as divine revelation as they are today? Answer, first century of Islam, each Qur'at provides the isnat and chain of narration all the way back to the Prophet. Muslims simply recite the standard narrative and they can't doubt the standard narrative because that implies not only doubting the Quran, but the one who said he would preserve it. But as we've seen, the truth is much more complicated. In the last 20 years, Kirat manuals from different time periods have been published with increasing frequency. These works are of great importance because they present the Kirat communities as dynamic groups struggling with the transmissions of the variant readings over the centuries. This situation is diametrically opposite to that of the later stagnant Kirat culture, whose religious authorities generously labeled both scholars and lay Muslims unbelievers when they challenged the validity of any Quranic reading. Let's see how all of this applies to the 1924 standardized Quran, which is based on the recitation of Hafs an Azam. Ibn Mujahid chose seven readers. However, traditionally, each reader has two authorized transmitters. Hafs an Azam is a reading from an imam named Azam for short in Kufa. His second authorized transmitter was Hafs. That was the reading chosen by the Egyptian committee led by Muhammad bin Ali al husseini al-Haddad to be the standardized Quran in 1924. Without doing any specific research on why the committee chose the reading that they did, it's easy to suggest that they were influenced by the fact that this reading had already been chosen in the 16th century by the Ottoman Empire. Thus, the reading was already fairly well established and familiar. But even now, with the standardized Quran selected again in 1924, things aren't so clear. There is no unanimity over the precise shape of the Hafs an Azm Qur'ah. Four different lines of transmission are claimed for it, and discrepancies abound in the various texts claiming to transmit it. Now in this video, I've tried to focus mainly on Ibn Majahid's seven readings, but for the sake of clarity, I do want to note that more canonical readings were added later. As Fred Donner says, thus one speaks of the seven canonical variant collections of the three after the seven, the four after the ten, and of multiple recensions of each of these 14 collections of variants. That's probably enough for one video, so let's summarize some major points. Variant readings of the Quran multiplied, and we saw 50 readings by the 11th century. Ibn Majahid did not argue his readings were divine. Remember, he compared them to legal rulings. The canonical readings quickly became divine, and we saw this example with Hamza al-Zayat. Muslims have falsely claimed the Quran is transmitted through Tawatr. Manuscripts played some significant part in the transmission of the Quran, i.e. it was not just orally transmitted. Even the precise shape of Hafs an Azam, the standardized Quran, is not clear. Numerous modern Muslims largely ignore the historical difficulties of the Quran's canonization, constructing instead a mythical polemic about the Council of Nicaea, which actually parallels Ibn Majahid's canonization. And modern Muslims, in contrast to early Muslims, stress the divine nature of all of the canonical readings and their traceability to Muhammad as a matter of orthodoxy. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.